Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of the Devil's Disciple. Not gonna lie guys, this one has given me the heebie-jeebies. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Yeah, I got scared researching this case. Maybe I'm gonna get scared recording this video, but I'm gonna do my best not to, although I'm already a bit freaked out. I can't even put my finger on it, but there is something that gets me. Anyway, as you can tell, I'm a little bit spicy. It's, uh, yeah, I'm overdone, but I'm really happy. Excited to be here, guys, excited to be here. Right, let's go. Let's begin this story on March the 21st in 1975 in Sean, Kent. This is where Father Anthony Crean was found dead in his bath. He was 64 years old and it was a very horrific and bloody and just awful crime scene. He was found fully dressed in the bath, submerged in water or partially submerged in the water. The water had turned bright red from blood. His face was really badly bruised. There was blood splatter on the ceiling, on the walls. Mm -mm -mm. And worst of all, I think, if we're honest, is the open wounds on his head. So he had been beaten over the head and it had split, actually split the skull. And there were, well, his brain was exposed. Let's not beat about the bush. His brain was exposed lovely and he had also been stabbed numerous times so this is rageful in 1973 two years previous to his murder father crean befriended a local troublemaker called patrick mckay despite father crean's kindness towards mckay he would fall into his old ways and he would actually rob father crean's home but the priest believed very much in showing this young man love and kindness because this was God's way. And this would just prove a very fatal mistake for Father Crean. The local police were well aware of the connection between Father Crean and Mackay. And so Mackay became a person of interest immediately and the hunt would begin. Within 48 hours, of the murder, Patrick Mackay was found, he was arrested, and he pretty much confessed almost immediately. Sit back and relax, if you can, because this is a story of failings. Many, many, many failings that have sadly led to this horrific, horrific murder. Patrick Mackay was born in September of 1952 in Middlesex, London. Patrick's father was Harold Mackay and he was a World War II veteran and an accountant and a violent and abusive alcoholic, mainly. Before Patrick was even born, he was an alcoholic and he was violent towards his wife. And when she was pregnant with Patrick, he he kicked her in her stomach when she was pregnant. So this is the sort of douche guy we're talking about here. When Patrick was very young, probably all that Patrick ever knew was that his, his father was violent and he beat Patrick from a very young age. And like, what do you expect, I guess, in, this, in these situations? But Patrick then just mirrored what he was seeing at home. He would then be just terrible. He, he was a terrible young boy. He bullied children that were much younger than him. I wonder why. It angers me and I think in this case it angered me just so much more and I don't really know why because I've read loads of histories of uh, serial killers and it's really common isn't it that alcoholism and abuse in in their life and then and then these these people these children turn into these quite frankly, monsters, like awful. And I just, I, in this case, it just really hit me, really hit me that this guy, this alcoholic, angry, violent coward, I'm going to say, because you're just beating your wife and your defenceless child, let's be real, coward, cowardly, and they ruin lives. 
I'm so angry. It, I don't know why it got to me in this case. It really did. Gin will help. Cowardly, vile monster makers. As a young child, Patrick, not only was he violent at school towards younger children, but he also then started to hurt innocent animals, usually cats and rabbits. And also there was mention of him like pinning birds down in the road and then waiting for cars to run them over. That's grim. And also the worst one. Well, that is all pretty bad, but I found this like, whoa. He roasted his pet t- tortoise alive. That's, oh, that's ick, isn't it? Just a very horrific start in life. Nothing but abuse, fear and pain. And then when he was 10 years old, his father got ready one morning and went to work. And on his walk into work, he dropped dead from a heart attack. Yes, you think. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, woohoo. Sadly, the damage was already done at this point for Patrick. He had died, the father had died from, well, he'd abused his body and he was an alcoholic, so his body just sort of gave up. And interestingly, before he died, when he went to work, before he left the house, oh, there's a little something there, I'm going to just get it because it's in my eyes. Yeah, before he left for work, he said to Patrick, get this, remember to be good. How, what, what a fuckwad. You have to model behaviour. Yeah, parenting 101. You can say all the crap you want. They copy what you do. And you're beating the shite out of him and his mother. Twat. Patrick did not attend his father's funeral. And in my research, there were kind of, it was conflicting. One thing I read said that he didn't want to go. Another thing that I read said that his mother didn't want him to attend and said he he couldn't attend. So I'm not sure, but he didn't attend. And he refused to believe. I kind of want to know which one of those stories is right because he refused to believe that his father had died and he would tell people that he he wasn't dead and he, he carried a photo of his father with him all the time. Now, if he didn't attend the funeral, had was that because he was like, what, I'm not going to, he's not dead? Or... Because his mum refused to let him go, did he then just develop this like coping mechanism and just say, you know, tell himself that he wasn't dead? I'm not sure. If it's the latter, it pro- it would have been better for her to let him go for closure, I guess. We all try our best, but he didn't attend and he refused to believe that his dad was dead. Patrick, before his father died, was already a naughty person boy violent tortured and killed animals he also used to steal so he did that from a very young age as well and when his father passed away it did absolutely nothing to curb Patrick's criminal activity it also did not make their household a more harmonious one because when I when I read that his father died I was you know oh great maybe things can improve from here and maybe his mum will... No, none of that. In fact, what happened is Patrick just took on the role of the man of the house. And all he's ever seen the man of the house be is violent, vile, just just terrible. So it, it, didn't, it didn't improve anything. In fact, I don't know whether... It, I, I can't say it was worse. I wasn't there. But it, just, it did not improve. Patrick would then begin beating his mum and his two sisters. Patrick's mother was from originally from Guyana. I hope I'm saying that correctly. It's in South America, Guyana, I think. And she decided that she was going to move the family there because she had family there. And I, I think just, well, just to have a fresh start, try again. But it did not help Patrick at all. And it must have been quite crap because they really quickly were back in the UK. When they came back to the UK, they went to Kent. I don't think I've ever said his mum's name. uh, Excuse me, Marion. So this whole ordeal, the death of her violent and abusive husband and being left with these three children and Patrick's awful behaviour, moving, blah, 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 the whole situation led to Marion having a nervous breakdown. So at this point, after all of these huge 
life events and a really crappy existence, to be honest. Marion then goes into a psychiatric facility because she's having this nervous breakdown. But effectively, just imagine that for those children for a minute. So now they are left with no parents. No, no one's there. They are with their aunt. But yeah, Marion was forced to call the police numerous times for Patrick's violent and horrible, awful behaviour. And Patrick also had the, I can't think of the name of it and I didn't write it down, This the love of lighting fires. I can't remember the name, sorry. You'll, you'll put it in the comments, I'm sure. But he had that, the word I'm thinking of is for having sex with dead bodies, Sophie. It's not that word. He likes starting fires. He's just, he is just a tick list of just like every, everything violent crime just isn't he he's just ticking all the boxes oh what can I do next so lighting fires he attempted to burn down a catholic church and I believe this is when he was institution 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 into into what institutionalized institution <laughs> Ah! Inst he was put into a psychiatric facility for the first time after this event. On his release from this, this institute, he was then put into a special school for naughty children. Between the ages of 12 and 22, Patrick was in and out of varying specialist schools, institutes and prison. At one point, he attempted to murder his aunt and his mum. He tried to strangle them to death. When he had failed to do so, he then tried to take his own life. This led to another stint in an institute. And so on and so on. It was just one thing after another. When Patrick was 15, he was actually diagnosed as a psychopath. And at many points between the ages of 12 and 22 many professionals would say that he was and would become, if he wasn't, a danger to society. Many times. Dr Leonard Carr, he was the doctor that diagnosed Patrick as a psychopath and he said that Patrick would end up as, quote, a cold psychopathic killer. Oh, I had a piece of um, sellotape on my scarf. Patrick was committed to Moss Side Hospital in Liverpool and he would be there for four years. During this time, he was tested extensively. Brain, just everything. And at this point, they were really interested in trying to find out whether that he could be rehabilitated. Nobody could really agree. And it was at, in this time when he was in hospital that varying experts one would say that they believed and there are so many studies on this and it's actually really interesting but that's like a whole thing that violent tendencies can be hereditary so they believe that that Patrick had not only because he'd witnessed his father being a douche but but just the mere fact that his father was his father that he had inherited these violent genes from his father interesting but that was, you know, that was sort of like mm, brushed over when I was researching this. Other people that saw Patrick and assessed him, they thought he was a lost cause. And other people thought that he was going to be OK to be rehabilitated with lots and lots of therapy. Nearly all of the professionals said that he had the capacity to become a murderer a killer of women he was kind of like marked down as a psychopath without mania he was released from moss side at the age of 20 in 1972 um it sounds like they did a lot of tests and they couldn't agree and they didn't know what to do with him that's a common theme in this story didn't know what to do although they all agreed he was a potential serial killer right even though at this point, at 20 years old, he's been in and out of institutes. He has tried to murder his mum, his aunt. Oh, and a child. He tried to murder a boy as well. I forgot to mention that, sorry. There's so much. He's tried to set fire to a cathedral, a church. And he's always, he's just... Oh. But at 20 years old, there's nothing we can do anymore. And he's released. Okay.
So that's where we're at, 1972. He failed in his first two jobs. So he came out of hospital, tried to be independent from his mother. He really wanted that and he failed. I couldn't find much information on what support they had really put in place. Oh my God, my finger got stuck, like locked in position. <laughs> oh, sorry, I need to get over that for a minute. That was weird. It doesn't sound like there was a lot of support and he became a drifter. So he was place to place, friend to friend, sofa to sofa and no job. He spent most of his days drinking or taking drugs. His violent behaviour meant that he was often turfed out of whoever's house and he was burning bridges with friends. He was stealing. He was stealing things to make money to buy drugs and alcohol. To make matters even worse, this, this story is just crazy. If you could guess, I don't know. Can you guess what I'm about to say? I doubt it. I, I was just like, oh, right. He idolised Hitler. So I'd idolised Hitler. He became fascinated with the extermination of the Jews. I mean, what a hobby. He made himself an, I mean, no wonder he was asked to move on all the time, because this is just crazy. He made himself like an SS uniform, put badges on it and all of that, made it, you know, had an armband and everything. He also collected Nazi memorabilia. And he would have a, a photograph of Hitler next to his bed. So he'd take that all around with him when he was moving. Like, OK, I mean, at this point, you just help yourself out. Help yourself out. Keep that a secret if that... You ju yeah. For fun, he would make Frankenstein dolls. I'm not sure. At, the, at this point, I... I uh, you know, it's just all mental, but he would make Frankenstein dolls, more than one, and then he would burn their eyes out. And he's not in an institute. Also, what a house guest. He did have a caseworker, so that was the answer at this point, was that he'd been released from hospital and he had a caseworker. I guess like a probation officer or, yeah, or a social worker, that sort of affair. But he refused to keep appointments and meetings he just he just wouldn't show up you know he was drunk and on drugs and he just wouldn't show up and so his caseworker kind of gave up and they would see each other occasionally when the stars would align and you know and that was that was it that was the state of that support doesn't feel safe at all doesn't feel enough and it doesn't feel right so at this point, he's burnt lots of bridges with friends. They've kicked him out. He's a weirdo. He's got a Frankenstein doll. No thanks. And at this point, this is when he meets the really kind and friendly Father Crean. Now, the priest liked to befriend people that he felt needed it. And it was very clear that Patrick was one of those people. Like, you know, he, he had a, a beacon above his head, like injured, lost soul. When they met, Father Crean bought Mackay a pint at a pub, and then this would become something that they would do together. They'd meet at the pub and have a have a pint. Mackay could not control himself. He could not control. He didn't know how to behave, and stealing was the only thing he knew. So he then, at that point, not long after their friendship had begun, he then broke into Father Crean's home and stole a cheque for £30. Now, Crean did report it. When they found out that it was Mackay, Father Crean said that he did not want to press charges. He was like, OK, you know, it was wrong, but I don't want to press any charges. And the police, I didn't know that, I didn't think they could do this, but they disagreed and they pressed charges. They just went ahead with it. But I thought if you didn't want that, it didn't happen. But I'm, I'm in this case, that, that didn't happen. So the whole thing went to court. Because of this whole ordeal, the court case and everything, he was, he was asked to repay Father Crean the money, but also given a fine. So it ended up being like 80 quid, 80 pounds. And it just really pissed Mackay off. I wonder if he knew that Father Crean didn't want to press charges. I assume so. Anyway, they didn't speak after that. So their friendship was over. This meant that Mackay, he ended up going back to London, started drifting about again. And 
would then spend time in and out of prison for just varying offences. In 1974, Mackay was picked up for, he was in the middle of trying to commit suicide. He was assessed and despite all of his history, he was deemed not to be like mentally ill and not to be very dangerous or whatever. So he was sent up to this ward to just be observed and then he was let go. He was let go and he immediately went to the house of Isabella Griffiths. She was 84 years old. Her house was in Chelsea in a fancy part of London. It's not clear whether he was known to Isabella before and I think I think he was. I think we'll go with that because that was that's that makes the most sense. But it, you know, this source claimed that he used to do odd jobs for Isabella. So this was a new sort of thing. He'd met her, she was an elderly woman and he would help her with her groceries and tr- shopping and carrying it into her house and all things like that. And she would in exchange give him a little bit of money. On this day, when he'd been released from hospital after trying to commit suicide and they deemed him all right because he settled down quite well, he went there and what's thought to have happened is that he asked her if she needed any assistance and she said no. But obviously he that wasn't to his liking because he wanted some money. So when she said she didn't need help, he just pushed himself into her property. This is where he then strangled Isabella Griffiths to death, just being released out of hospital. He dragged Isabella's body to the kitchen and then he took a 12-inch knife and he like stabbed it into her into her abdomen. She 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 was dead, but it was like anger and frustration. He took it out on her on her body. He then got some food from the kitchen and sort of settled himself in and chilled out for a bit. After a while, he went back to the kitchen and he removed the knife from her stomach. And he said later on that at that point, he really contemplated ending his own life again. So he was going to use the knife and he was going to end it all. But for some reason, he didn't. Instead, he decided to make Isabella more comfortable, even though, you know, cover her. He closed her eyes and he covered her body. And then randomly, I read, I read this. I mean, I mean, I'm going to share it with you, but I don't know why. But he then put some dishes, the dishes that I think he'd used, into the sink and ran the tap. And I just thought, well, that's to get rid of like fingerprints or whatever. So he did that. But then he put a pair of shoes in the sink as well. I, not his, I don't think, but a pair of shoes in the sink and then, you know, and got them all wet. I mean, I don't know why I'm surprised. He's clearly like having some sort of episode. Uh, His life is an episode, but you know what I mean. He obviously had an awareness of fingerprints because he took the knife with him. I think that's why he, maybe he'd touched the shoes. Maybe they were her shoes. He took them off. I don't know. But anyway, they went in the sink and he took the knife with him and he lobbed it. He just lobbed it. On his walk home, he just threw it into some bushes. It took two weeks for poor Isabella to be found. When she was found, the police originally thought that she had died from natural causes. Oh. So she died and then she covered her own body with a sheet. Right? They hadn't had their wee books, had they? Then they found the stab wound in her tummy. Oh. There were no witnesses. There was no evidence. And effectively, Mackay, at this point, he, he got away with murder. Later that year, a social worker was asked, ordered to take Mackay in. I I think that's quite unusual. They really did not know what to do with this chap. My gut, you know, like when you have a little gut feeling, my gut is just like the next time he's arrested, put him into a facility. Is that really wrong of me? Because I I think in this country, we look at like past offences and we're like, oh, and it can kind of like almost build up and it can, I think I'm right. I'm probably, oh God, anyone with like, you know, uh, what's it called? Criminal, I I can't, the words are not there today. I don't know. I've used all my words. That's it. You know, anyone that knows anything about the law, they'll be like, oh, Sophie, 
but I think like, you know, it's like, oh, well, you, you know, you did that and you've done that and you've done that. So we're going to just say that you get 10 years, even though like one of those things might have just been something minor, but it all gets added up together. Why couldn't they do this? Why couldn't they be like, just, do you know what? Common sense. You're not right. You're not all there. And, you know, I mean, you tried to kill your mum and your aunt. So what we're going to do is we're going to put you in this lovely hospital. Is it money? Am I being really naive? I don't know. But just in my 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 brain, just do that. Do that years ago, before this. So this poor social worker, he's now lumbered with somebody that's very mentally unwell, although although he's not. He's not unwell. He's he's fine. But this guy. And he takes him in and he had probably the worst time of his life and is probably highly traumatised to this day. Mackay would talk at length about his horrifically violent fantasies. He told the social worker that he thought that he was possessed by the devil. I bet he locked his bedroom door every freaking night. I just gave myself frills. I swear I should write a horror film because I just think things that are like so scary. I just thought, imagine he locked himself. This is grim. This is scary. This is horror, right? Imagine he locked himself in, came home, just ran upstairs, locked himself in his room and was like, oh, with a takeaway. That's what he did every night. But one night, the wardrobe door opens. Oh, shit, I've given myself the chills. And there he is. Oh, I'm going to dream about that tonight. Okay. Eventually, Mackay was ordered to leave the social worker's abode. God knows what happened there, what he did. But by this point, he really didn't have anywhere else to go. I think that's why he was at the social worker's house, because, you know, they did, they did not know what to do with him and there was nowhere for him to go. Not long after he'd been kicked out, evicted from the social workers, he went back when the property was empty and he robbed it. Standard. This got him arrested again because, you know, oh, oh, I wonder who did it. And he was put into prison for four months. At this point, at this point, you know, should we do something else? Put into prison for four months. It is doing nothing. It is doing nothing. In fact, I'm laughing, but it's not funny. In fact, in this four month jolly in prison, he, I mean, he's getting fed three meals a day. He needs to be in a hospital right? I'm just going to put it out there. He needs to be in a secure facility. And they know, I feel like, how can end everyone not know that? Anyway, oh God, it's angering me, the vein. Ooh. So in his recent time in prison, this four months, he is devising his plan for when he comes out of prison. Not, oh, I'm going to get myself a job. I'm going to sort it. I'll move in with my mum. No. He decides, based on what's happened with Isabella, most likely, that he's going to mug elderly women, right? He's either going to mug them because they're really easy targets or like with Isabella, he is going to befriend and charm. He's quite charming. I think he can be quite charming when he wants to be. He's going to befriend and charm elderly folk, elderly women, and then rob them. So once he's sort of in there and, you know, friendly Mackay, He's then going to find out where they live and rob them for money. So this is his plan. Sorry, I'm holding my lip juicer. I do like to have something to hold. I should maybe get myself like some fidgets or something because this hand is cramping where I'm like just being silly with it. Why? I'm a bit on one today. On March the 10th in 1975, really sadly, Mackay would commit a very similar crime to that of the one with Isabella. He knocked on the door of 89-year-old Adele Price. She offered him a glass of water and when her back was turned, he, he strangled Adele. He left her body in the kitchen on the floor face down and then he went and had a nap on her sofa. So we have now entered into proper like serial killer territory here. There's no motive for murdering Adele. She's elderly. He could have just robbed her apartment or, you know, with her there. And she couldn't have done anything. He could have tied her up. He could have just robbed her in the street. But no, he chose to strangle Adele. He was woken up by somebody trying to enter the apartment. Can you imagine that? I bet that gave him quite a fright. 
it turned out that this was Adele's granddaughter. She actually lived there as well. When the granddaughter could not get into the flat, she went down into the hall to like ring to phone her grandmother in the flat and say, look, I can't get in, what's going on? But when she went down into the hall to do that, Mackay exited the flat and walked straight past the granddaughter. So they did not know each other. Then obviously, sadly, Adele's body was discovered. And again, the police. When they first saw Adele, they thought that she died of natural causes. I can see that there was no stab wound. She wasn't covered this time. She was just like collapsed in her kitchen on the floor. However, the place had been burgled. So then they decided that actually it was probably a homicide. But we let them off, you know, at first, yeah, it might have looked like she just had a heart attack. It was only five days after Adele's murder that Mackay would travel back to Kent to go and see Father Crean. And he was cross. He was being teased by some acquaintances, friends, about his past relationship with Father Crean. And they were suggesting that his relationship with Crean was a sexual one. And that was not the case. They were friends and Father Crean had befriended him. But in Mackay's mind, he wanted to seek revenge for this like teasing that he was a part of. And he just, he wanted it to stop once and for all. He wanted to prove that he had no feelings towards Father Crean. He was very angry. This time, he took two knives with him on the train to go and visit Father Crean. En route, he purchased a chicken. And he took that to his mother's house because his mother lives in Kent. And he asked her, told her probably, to cook up a chicken dinner and that he'd be back later to eat it. He then walked down to the convent and he called out for Father Crean and the door was slightly ajar. So he walked in and he he called out for him. When Father Crean saw Mackay, he he panicked and he tried to leave. He probably oh, he probably knew that this was not going to go well. And then there was a tussle. This is when Mackay says that he punched Father Crean in the in the face. So he, he was bruised. I think he probably punched him more than once. And at this point, Father Crean legged it and he tried to lock himself in the bathroom. Mackay got to the door before Father Crean could lock it and this is when they sort of like he barged in and he pushed Father Crean into the bath. Oh I haven't done a disclaimer in a while but I think I mean some people might find this a bit gruesome so I'll put a timestamp on for when I've stopped talking about the gruesomeness just if you if you're not in the mood today. When Father Crean is in the bathtub Mackay carries on hitting him that's why he's got such a bruised face and he then uses one of the knives and he stabs Father Crean in the neck and the side of the head multiple times. And I, I naively thought that kind of with those sorts of injuries, that's game over and it would be quite quick. But sadly, not. Mackay then tried to stab Father Crean through the top of the skull, so straight down. And he kept having a go from the sounds of it, and it didn't work. It it, it wouldn't work. So it it bent the knife, actually. This is when Mackay used an axe. So he got an axe. He then repeatedly struck Father Crean over the head with this axe. This caused the priest to fall back, sort of like lay back into the bathtub. And at this moment, this is when Mackay says that he lost control. He said, quote, something in me just exploded. It's almost like all of these years and all of the just everything that we've just talked about, just just a volcano of rage and anger. And yeah, it all just came out, sadly for Father Crean. He said that the priest was still alive, but unable to move. Just awful. And still alive, again, in my naivety, if you have had your head chopped with an axe and been stabbed in the neck and the side of your head, all you can hope is that he was barely conscious. Mackay then put the plug in the bath and and started to fill it up with water. And really sadly, it took Father Crean about an hour to die. Mackay said that he was he had no control over his movements, Father Father Crean. So yeah, a lot of uh, damage to his brain. 
at one point, Grim, at one point, Father Crean reached up with his hand and actually touched his exposed brain. Oh my God. That's like Hannibal. And that when Father Crean finally passed away, poor man, Mackay said that he stayed there for about 15 minutes, just like taking it in and staring at his corpse because he just he he was fascinated, absolutely fascinated by it. And then he left and he went to his mother's to eat the chicken dinner that he'd requested her to make. I have questions there. Did you take your clothes off? I don't think so. So he must have been covered in blood. What's just happened is absolutely horrific. But can you imagine your terrifying son walking in, demanding a chicken meal covered in blood? No. Later that night, one of the nuns sadly found Father Crean's body. And Mackay was arrested by the same police officer that arrested him two years earlier for robbing Father Crean's house. Things started to unravel quite quickly at this point because at a similar time to all of this, Mackay, he's arrested. They find him. He's arrested for the murder of Father Crean. He confesses. Also, an investigator further away back in London finds a fingerprint at one of the other murder scenes one of the elderly women, and so he wasn't that careful, probably at Adele's maybe, and he is, it's a match. Obviously his fingerprints are in the database because he's a naughty, that's not even the word, he is terrible. But yeah, so they then have a match for his fingerprint at another murder scene. He ended up confessing to three murders of elderly women, as well as the murder of Father Crane. However, when he was incarcerated, he could not stop blabbing on. And he told, you know, anyone, cellmates, that he, about loads of other murders. So investigators caught wind of this and they had him back out. They interrogated him again. And then he confessed to 11 murders spanning over a two year period. What the heck? I made a note of them. So in January 1974, Stephanie Britton and her four year old grandson, they were stabbed um, stabbed to death somewhere called Hadley Green. That's in Hertfordshire. Then a few days later, Mackay threw an old man to his death from Hungerford Bridge. So this is 1974, January. So that was before he had his... He was um, arrested for trying to kill himself. Then he was arrested for trying to kill himself... And then in the February of 1974, he he murdered Isabella. Not long after that, later on in 1974, he bludgeoned to death a 62-year-old tobacconist with a piece of lead pipe in Finsbury Park. And then Sarah Rodwell, aged 92, he beat her to death on her doorstep in Hackney. In Southend, Ivy Davis he killed her with an axe. March the 10th, 1975, he murdered Adele Price in her apartment. And then 11 days later, he murdered Father Preen. He later went on to recant all of his confessions. He was like, no, no, didn't do it. Again, when he was in prison, awaiting trial, he underwent many, many psychiatric tests. They had to sort of decide whether he was like fit to stand trial, stuff like that. Was he mentally ill? Different professionals said that he had a personality disorder and that he was a psychopath. No shit, shut up. But he was deemed fit to stand trial. On November the 21st, 1975, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter with diminished responsibility. He requested, he wanted to be sent to a psychiatric hospital for therapy, but like, you know, indefinitely. That's what, what he actually requested. But the judge called Mackay a highly dangerous person. Yeah. And he was sentenced to life in prison. Mackay is actually the longest serving prisoner in the UK, 46 years so far. And he was sentenced to life in prison, but not without the possibility of parole or indefinitely. Oh, no, no. This man, like, you know, he was first up for parole and eligible for like possible release in 1995. Have we not learned a sodding thing? He was denied parole. 
and has been denied ever since. However, as of 2017, Mackay has been in open prison. And I'm not going to lie, it does give me the actual heebie-jeebies. Like, this actually makes my blood run a bit cold. It really does. They have said that he will likely never actually be released from prison, right? But open prison, it just, I find that really frightening, that, that I find it frightening that he's in open prison. And what do I know? But I personally find that a bit frightening. The first 27 years of his prison sentence were served in like a category A prison because of his behaviour. And they were like really concerned about it. So he was in 27 years in like a, like, you know, okay, a bad boy prison. He even struggled to sort of adapt when they did put him originally into an open prison. He 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 struggled with like the not having the structure of a normal prison and it it failed. And then he was put back into a normal prison. And then again in 2017, that's when he was then put into an open prison. And he's been there ever since. So an open prison means that he's allowed temporary release, you know, here and, and there to spend time in the community. All I can hope is that that is always supervised. Someone let me know that knows anything, but is that always supervised? He has to go back to prison to sleep and stuff, you know, he has to sleep there, he has to go back there. But I'm sure I've heard cases where people are in open prison and they just like one day just they don't go back. How I find that utterly so scary and disturbing for somebody with what what we've just heard about, like don't you? And quite amazingly, there are psychologists out there that, you know, independent people that, that were hired by his sort of legal team that said that they would support him being released, released, properly released from from open prison. That's it. What do I know? I mean, I guess he's getting on now, but still. That is all I have for you on today's story. Bit of a corker, wasn't it? Bit of a corker. Thank you so much for joining me today for another episode of Sin and Tonic. Hope you can join me next week for another true crime story. I think my eyes crossed. And a mug or a glass or a vase or a vat or a tumbler of gin. I do love my zebra cut, by the way. Beautiful. Not much to report this week, I'm afraid. I've been quite boring because I've just got an essay to write and that's where all my words have gone. That's why I couldn't speak today, because all my words have come out of my brain into my laptop, basically. But I'm getting there. I've got to finish it tonight by midnight. So that will be interesting. Onwards and upwards. Maybe that's why I've been so excited to be out the shed, because it's just like a break from... It's not a very nice essay, actually, to be honest. It's all about... It's just not nice. I don't like writing about hardships that children have to be honest. Not my favourite. So I can't wait for it to be over. But that's why I'm happy, probably more happy than normal to be up the shed because it's like, <sighs> instead of that, I can talk about true crime. Grimness. I hope you all have a beautiful weekend. I look forward to chatting to you in the comments. My eyes are so dry. Don't cry. Dry your eyes. Stop. I will speak to you all next week. Love you lots. Bye.